Okay, so now we are through to our next talk, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you John Poole. So he'll be introducing to you Please, which is definitely a build system that uh, I'm personally very interested in. So I'll, I'll give you over to him right now. Oh, yeah, thank you very much, Chris. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, so uh, my name's John. Um, here's a picture of me in case the video is not good enough. Uh, I am the build systems lead at a company called Thought Machine. Uh, if you haven't heard of us, uh, they are a fintech based out of uh, Old Street in London. Um, so you make sort of core banking software, but uh, I'm here to talk to you about our build systems today. So what is Please? So in a lot of ways, Please is like Bazel. Uh, if you're familiar with the Bazel build systems, um, it's got much of the same features that you might expect. Uh, it's designed for heterogeneous monorepos, so it supports lots of different languages and all of that sort of stuff. Um, it's got a Python-esque metadata language, very, very similar to Skylark, uh, Starlark. Um, we're very static and explicit about our dependencies between each of the build tasks and our build graph. Um, and our tasks are executed in these hermetic build environments where we control all the input files and we do all of the uh, control all the environment variables that are available. Um, and we, we even do some Linux namespacing stuff to, to even lock that down a bit further. Um, and we achieve minimality and correctness uh, in much the same way as Bazel would through robust hashing of the tasks themselves as well as all the inputs to those tasks. Um, we also are a client of the remote execution API. So we have clustered builds. You can schedule that across hundreds of workers. Um, and we're using that to great effect here at Thought Machine. Uh, this talk wouldn't be very interesting if Please was like Bazel. Uh, it was exactly like Bazel. So in a lot of ways, it's not like Bazel. Um, sort of serendipitously, I think uh, Ulf's talk kind of leads on to this. But um, it's written in Go, uh, which means that there's no operational sort of runtime overheads. There's no sort of background worker processes. There's no spin up time for JVMs or interpreters or any kind. Um, so yes, yeah, compiled language. Uh, this makes it operationally simpler. So there's no sort of managing of background processes, uh, but it's also got some other advantages. Uh, it's got a more elegant memory models. Well, elegant. Um, it's got structs, which can be more memory efficient than uh, classes because you can allocate things uh, like contiguously in memory, um, which saves space. Uh, but you can also allocate things uh, on the stack more readily rather than always having it being heap allocated, which helps avoid uh, garbage collection pressure. Um, and talking about the heap and garbage collection, uh, the heap is actually, it, it, the garbage collector in Go is actually quite different to the one in Java. It's not a generational garbage collector, which means there's no upfront allocation um, of the heap. Uh, and it, that means it's able to return memory back to the OS more readily. Um, and you don't have to, um, you know, set that up. Uh, and most importantly, you don't get uh, Java heap space out of memory errors. Um, you, I'm not saying it doesn't run out of memory, but when it does, it's because it's actually ran out, the host system's actually run out of memory, um, which means there's no JVM options to sort of tweak. You don't have to sort of pre-allocate memory to the JVM and, and sort of balance that with how much you want to leave over for the build. Um, and this is quite important to non-Java developers that are less tolerant of this sort of stuff. Um, Beyond the language choice, I think the actual paradigm or the, the implementation of uh, the paradigm is quite different as well. So uh, we aim to be a bit more of a toolkit. One of the original design goals from Please was to migrate from Buck, where we found it quite difficult to extend Buck beyond its original use cases. So uh, it's designed from extension from the ground up. Um, we provide the same toolbox uh, the, uh, that the official rules use, like our first party rules use to all of our third party rule developers. Um, so adding custom rules is quite diff uh, quite easy with please. Um, I think uh, Bazel's kind of trying to move into this kind of homogenous uh, build graph, um, but so sort of please sort of started there. Um, so yeah, uh, and indeed someone actually managed to write some third party alternatives to the built-in rules, which I, I think you know it, it shows that we've we've kind of achieved that goal to some extent. Um, and I think that, you know Bazel's achieved a similar goal, but um, yeah. Uh, we, we kind of have like a smaller minimalistic feature set. So uh, we kind of try and use uh, like a, a homogenous design around um, a lot of the core concepts rather than introducing new abstractions for things. And I think this is really evident in the way we approach tool chains, which I'll get onto later. Hopefully it'll start to make a bit more sense what I'm talking about here when we get onto that bit. Um, so yeah, this talk's gonna be split into two key parts. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna talk about our build graph and, and what a homogenous build graph means and what that affords us uh, and how we actually build that up using our build language. And then the second tarp, uh, part of this talk is actually how we schedule that work for execution using our uh, unified uh, build and parse phase. Um, so yeah, what does the build language look like? 
Um, so the build language is something called ASP. If you're familiar with Starlock, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. It's essentially Python without the classes. Uh, it's written in pure Go. It was actually uh, designed and released around the same time uh, Starlock was as well. So, so I mean, you know, um, yeah, we kind of uh, ended up doing very similar work around the same time. Uh, one big difference between our build language and how uh, Bazel uses Starlock is that um, all build definitions are just ASP functions. There's no sort of distinction between your definition and your implementation, um, which I think is conceptually easier for rule authors. Um, and then these, these built-ins are able to produce all of their intermediate targets um, just in the body of their build function. Um, and then targets are registered to the graph uh, with the build rule built-in, um, which we'll get onto right now. So this is what build rule looks like. If you're familiar with general, it's essentially very, it's very similar to general. Um, you, you give it a name, which uniquely identifies this within the current package. Um, you set up some dependencies, so you can depend on some sources, in this case, uh, file.txt. Um, and then the uh, tools is quite interesting. Um, so this is coming from our config global, which is set up from our please config file. Um, so word count tool could either be just the string WC, in which case we'll look it up on the system, on, on the path that we have configured for please. Um, or it could be a build label, in which case we'll go away and build it and then make that available to the build rule uh, in a similar fashion. Um, and then we can define some outputs for our rule, uh, which is where we're expected to produce our outputs to. Uh, and then indeed, um, please will sort of set up our hermetic build environment. And in doing so, we'll set up some environment variables to help discover these uh, inputs. So tool in this case might be set to um, just WC, or in the case if it's a build rule, it will be set to, um, you know, Similar to, to how sources would be set up, it's set to a path to that uh, build rule within the directory. Uh, similar thing with sources, and then out will be set to file.wc, which allows us to output to where we expect it to. Um, so yeah, hopefully that gives you some idea of what build rule is. Let's have a look at how we might actually build, build up some complexity using that. So build definitions, as I mentioned, are just functions. So um, here's a very simplified version of how you might do protobuf code generation with please. Uh, if you don't know, protobuf's uh, an interface definition language. Uh, it allows you to essentially define a bunch of data types, a bunch of um, endpoints, uh, like remote procedure call endpoints uh, in a language agnostic way. And you can generate um, some code from that uh, to help uh, give type safety between services, essentially. Um, so yeah, it's just an ask function. Uh, it takes in a number of parameters. We've got the name, uh, the sources that we want to take in, the dependencies we want to take in, uh, and the visibility within the build graph that this rule has can be depended on. Um, we might need to register some intermediate targets. So in this case, we want to have a code generation rule for each of the languages that we're uh, generating protobuf for. Um, and this is going to make a call to tools protocy, as you can see here. Um, and that's going to be set up to uh, you know, the protocy compiler. Uh, and that's going to return us a build label representing that build rule. So that's what sources get set to. And then uh, the namesake of the proto library is just a build rule um, of that name. And uh, yeah, we set the sources and everything. And this, this could go away and actually compile those sources into some sort of compiled artifact for that library. So, so for, for Go, it might be a .a archive file that we can depend on. Um, and then on the consumer side, you just make a call to proto library. Uh, when please encounters this within the build file, it's going to execute that proto library uh, build definition, make a bunch of calls to build rule, which will register targets in the build graph. Uh, and then you can register, you can depend on these um, just like you would in, in Bazel. Uh, you've got colon flags proto, which refers to that proto library. Now, having everything be a build rule affords us some pretty neat command line utilities. Um, for example, we've got a built in uh, command line utility called please query print. And you can give this any target within the build graph, and it will print you the Python representation of the build rule invocation that generated that target. So in this case, I'm looking at the actual proto C um, Go invocation, the thing that generates the Go, Go sources from the proto file. Uh, it's significantly more complicated than the little example I've given here. But you can see, uh, you know, we've got some uh, the name at the top there. Uh, under that, we've got some sources that, that we're actually turning, so the flags.proto. Uh, and then sort of in the middle there, we've got the command we're about to execute. You can see it does some preambles, it's creating some directories, it's uh, exporting some environment variables, but eventually it boils down to an invocation to tools proto C, uh, and that, that generates us our Go code from our proto file. Um, another one of these command line utilities that's super useful uh, is 
uh, on all of the build and test commands, we have dash dash shell. And what this does is it actually prepares us this hermetic build environment and allows us to step into it um, in a bash shell where we have all the environment variables set up. We have all the directories set up as they would in the actual build. And it's essentially just like, here's the command we're about to execute. And you can step through that and try and debug it. And this is a super useful tool for all of our rule authors. And indeed, just general users of please to just try and get a grip of what's going on. Um, so you can see here, uh, it's printing out that we're going to make some directories. You can start like stepping through that. Uh, and I've, I've just invoked tree. And you can see um, all the files are available to us there. Um, so I mentioned everything's a build rule. I do mean everything. Uh, that includes our tool chain. So um, if you wanted to define a Go tool chain in Please, uh, on the definition side, we'd have an ASP uh, function, as you might expect, that takes in a number of parameters. We might have the name of the rule that uh, we're going to create and the version of the Go tool chain we want to download. Um, that definition might uh, have a build rule that will download and extract the, uh, the SDK for us. Um, and there's a way that we can label certain files within the SDK as entry points. Um, so we could say like slash bin go is an entry point into the go tool chain. On the usage side, uh, you, you might you just make an invocation to go tool chain and this will go ahead and register um, your build uh, your, uh, build target for that. And then on the configuration side, we can just set go tool to that build target. And this little uh, annotation at the end of the build label pipe go is how we define which entry point we, we mean from that tool chain. Um, so yeah, um, this will be made available. If you remember, we have this uh, config.wc uh, tool. Uh, there's a config.go tool, and we'll pass that into the Go rules, and please we'll figure out how to do that. So it might be Go on the path, or it might be Go from the tool chain. And as far as the build rule authors are concerned, it's the same. Um, this is quite different to how Bazel would go about something like this. Uh, there's, a, there's a number of concepts you have to wrap your head around. You have to you have like a toolchain type, a toolchain provider, and a toolchain implementation. And then on the workspace definition, you would have to uh, on the workspace side, you'd have to like register all the dependencies there and register your toolchains and all that sort of stuff. And this, I think there's a lot more going on there. Um, it's like a much higher level abstraction than what we've got in Please. Um, but one of the things that Bazel was trying to achieve with this toolchain abstraction was cross-compiling. So let's talk a little bit about how we achieve cross-compiling in Please. Um, you can specify a target architecture. So um, there's a number of ways to do this. You can either do it per label. So you can have this like at Linux AMD64, and this specializes that build label to that um, architecture. Uh, and alternatively, you can also just do it on the fly with the dash dash arch flag. Um, so if you do please build, you can do please build dash dash arch Linux AMD64. And this essentially, uh, if nothing specifies an architecture specifically, it will default to that architecture, which allows you to do like on the fly cross compiling. Um, this target architecture is made available to the build files uh, and indeed the build definitions. So uh, it's made available through the config global. You have config.os, config.hostos, config.targetos. And um, we reparse each build file to create the specialized version of the build target. Um, and because the build definitions have access to the target operating system, they can change their compiler invocations or what tool chain they're going to use. They can pass new flags to the compiler to, to cross compile, or they can just um, depend on a completely different tool chain because um, you know, we're, compi we're cross compiling. Um, hopefully, that gives you some idea how we uh, can build up quite quite complex and feature complete things from uh, a reasonably low level abstraction, uh, like a reasonably small abstraction. Um, so yeah, the next part of the talk, as promised, is going to be on the scheduler and how we actually schedule this to be executed and how, this work, uh, how we end, end up uh, building this stuff. So first of all, let's just give a brief overview of how Bazel would go around something like this. Uh, Bazel has multiple steps that it needs to go through before it can start building stuff. First of all, it needs to do the workspace preparation, which involves downloading any third-party rule definitions or any other repos that you want to include in your build graph. Um, once it's done that, it's able to get on with the parse phase, uh, at which point it can start um, executing the, um, the build graph and generating all these build targets. These build targets are a slightly higher level than the please build graph. They'll be like Java binary or something like that. Um, and then these are executed against providers in order to generate some lower level actions, um, I, I believe. And yeah, essentially, there's another phase to convert them into actions. And then there's a strategy for implementing these actions. And you can like, a strategy might be execute them remotely or execute them locally. Uh, I'm not a Bazel developer, but that's how I understand it. 
Please, on the other hand, has no analysis phase. Uh, we just kind of just do the thing, the schedulers, uh, a single stage scheduler. So what I'm getting at here is that there's no distinct stages. The, as we're parsing the uh, build files, uh, if we want to build that target, we can add it to the build queue immediately once it's parsed. Um, this is done using a highly parallel uh, model. Uh, we take full advantage of uh, Go's green threads and channels. So there's no mutex locks uh, contention, um, and there's uh, no real downside of having lots of blocking Go routines. So we're able to just spin up thousands of these things and um, achieve really good CPU utilization. Um, but one thing this uh, unified build and parse phase allows us to do is to take a bit more time parsing. And we can do some slightly expensive operations during parse time, uh, including building targets for dynamic dependencies. Uh, and I'll get onto that in a minute. But before we do that, I kind of want to give you some idea of how the scheduler might be possible. Um, the, this is kind of a lie because it's a bit, bit more complicated than this. Uh, but essentially, um, hopefully I can give you some idea of, of, of how something like this might be possible. So starting on the left-hand side, you can see we please build some target. Uh, please will then immediately queue this up to be built. Um, and what that means depends on if the package the target belongs to is parsed or not. So in this case, it's not parsed. So we must queue the package up to be parsed. We're now looking at the middle column here. So once we queue it up to be parsed, um, we will uh, you know, load that package. We'll check if it's been parsed already because it might be you know, a highly parallel system. It's something else might have parsed it already. If it's not parsed already, then we um, load the build file and start interpreting it. Um, as we go through the build file and start interpreting things, uh, we start invoking build rule invocations. And when we see a build rule invocation that matches our build target that we queued up to be built, uh, we will stop and look at this. Um, we will queue all of its dependencies up to be built, and they'll go through the same sort of workflow. And then we'll uh, spin off a Go routine that blocks waiting to add that to the build queue. Uh, and what it's waiting for is for all of its dependencies to be built. Um, yeah, uh, so you know the dependencies go through the same uh, uh, workflow on the left-hand side. Eventually, one of the dependencies presumably will be in a package that's already been parsed, and then it will queue itself up to be built, which happens on the right-hand side. And this just does as you might expect. Uh, it goes away and builds the target. And after the target's been built, it sends a notification on a channel to the blocking thing that's dependent on it, saying, I'm now built. You might want to wake up and queue yourself to be built if, if you're ready. So that's how we kind of synchronize adding things to the build graph and adding things to the build queue. Um, so yeah, um, one thing this allows us to do is to have uh, something called post-build functions. So these are functions that execute immediately after a build and allow us to do some slightly interesting things. So they can perform a number of operations. Uh, sorry, first of all, they consume the standard output of the build action. Um, so that's the sort of interface they have with the, the actual build action. Uh, and from this, they can perform a number of actions. Uh, they can dynamically add new targets to the build graph. Uh, typically, we don't do this very often because it's quite difficult to reason about, but it can be useful in a few niche situations. Uh, they can add metadata to the, build, to the rule. So this is com commonly used to collect the license for third-party libraries, and we can automatically verify that's one of the licenses we accept. But we can also collect linker flags for all of our C libraries or whatever. Uh, and we can add this metadata to the task itself in the build graph. And then when we come to link against that library, we can collect up all of these, these flags and apply the correct linker flags. And because we execute this before we store outputs, we can actually modify which outputs we store. Um, but you might be wondering, so Bazel has this workspace preparation phase where we uh, download all, our, all of our third-party build definitions. So what about third-party build definitions and please? Well, that's handled uh, through a built-in called subinclude. Um, and uh, it looks a bit like this. So on the left-hand side, we have a package. Uh, we're su sub-including our Kubernetes build definitions. That's what this build def cates thing is. And on the right-hand side, we have our build def cates. Um, I think people are probably familiar with the file group. Essentially, it just re-exports its, uh, its sources. So this outputs a cates.builddefs file. And then on the left-hand side, again, after we've done that sub-include, we now have access to any top-level definitions in that def build defs file, including this cates config uh, build definition which is just an ask function, top level definition. So what's going on here? So the subinclude target uh, can perform any arbitrary actions. You know, in this case, it's just a file group, but it can be, the only restriction of that build action is it must produce some sort of parsable output. Um, as I mentioned, the top level definitions and that parsable output are added to the current scope, um, you know, the case config here. 
uh, and it can perform many actions. Uh, I guess if you're feeling kind of mental, you can do some sort of meta programming where you generate build definitions of some metadata on in the repo. Um, more sensibly, you could do some. Uh, you could download a build definition from a remote file. Um, you know, imagine some sort of GitHub releases page with some build definitions on it. Uh, or you can include build definitions from uh, another please repo that you've sub included through one of the sub repo built-ins, either GitHub repo or or something else. Um, if you're feeling uh, more adventurous, uh, you could parse a file on disk to try and generate a bunch of build files on the fly, or uh, generate a bunch of build rules on the fly, I should say, actually. Um, it's a slight typo. Uh, you know, you could parse a requirements.txt and generate a bunch of pip library invocations and then parse that into the build graph on the fly. Um, you could also download a foreign CMake repo. So I know CMake has this idea of generators, so you could try and like, dynamically generate a please graph from a CMake repository uh, and try and add that to the graph. This isn't something please currently does, but I'm, I'm interested in this sort of use case for subinclude um, for, for third party libraries that are foreign repos to please, foreign build systems to please. Um, so this uh, this is very complex, uh, but it has some analysis uh, advantages. Uh, there's no upfront uh, up analysis phase, so we can get, get building and keep the build queues fed uh, while we're still parsing and doing all of this sort of analysis on the go. Um, it's conceptually simpler for rule authors. You don't have to think about how setting up your workspace uh, correctly before you can start building your rules. Uh, and there's no like single workspace file that becomes a bit unwieldy in, in the center of the, the repo. So yeah, um, it's pretty much the uh, end of my talk. Uh, thanks for listening. Are there any questions? Uh, John, thank you very much for that. That was great. Um, yeah, so we've got one question right now uh, for you. So um, does the shell flag only allow stepping through the build in a debug workflow? Or can you also use the shell flag to run some sort of development environment? For example, could it work like Nix shell? Uh, I'm not familiar with Nix shell. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but uh, it, it just essentially pops you up a, a terminal, a, a bash session inside the hermetic build environment, so you can play around with the the build rule. Um, okay, so in principle, you could you know attach some kind of debugger to it and then step through if you so chose. Uh, okay. uh, I don't think uh, step through what exactly because the uh, the build rule action is just a bash command. Maybe that's where the confusion's coming from. So you you can't really step through a bash command like that. Uh, yeah, I guess it's when if if you're doing it over, let's say, an action that might have several oh. steps, and then that or, or or like some, I think something akin to a general, for example, I think that's where that, that that's where it might be coming from. Okay, yeah, I, I don't think please actions have several steps. Um, so the way we would do something similar is we'd actually generate multiple actions for the same build definition, um, which is what I meant by the intermediate rules. So each individual action is its own build target that you can dash dash shell. Right, okay, yeah. all right. Um, yeah, so I guess my other question was how, um, I mean, you said that this that this is a remote execution a, um, a client as well. So um, I was just wondering, could you uh, spend a couple of seconds kind of like going into that in a little bit more, in a little bit more detail? Uh, yeah, so we I think we support build grids uh, quite semi well. Uh, I don't think we have, so internally at Thought Machine, we've actually got our own implementation of the remote execution servers. Um, so it's still a bit early days with integrating with the wider ecosystem. Um, a lot of clients uh, don't support some of the API usages that we need. So Build Buddy uh, is currently not available for please. Um, but yeah, we're definitely interested in, in maturing that. We've, we've done some testing on our side and it seems to work in, in the trivial case. Um, and I'm, I'm very interested in uh, sort of taking that a bit further now that we've kind of matured our remote execution capabilities a little bit. Um, I have another question here. Um, how does please vary compared to Bazel in relation to local sandboxing? Uh, I'm not familiar with local sandboxing with Bazel, uh, but we sandbox the mount so that we have a read-only version of the whole host OS. Uh, and we um, basically remount into slash temp and, and all of that stuff. So. Uh, yeah, you can you get like a, a read-only version of the host operating system, and uh, your temp directory is is where you can execute your command. And we do some network sandboxing optionally if you want to restrict access and say like this this rule does some networky stuff, but.
but this rule should be um, you know pure, shouldn't connect to the internet. So you're able to sort of do it at that level. Uh, is that comparable to what Basil does? Uh, um, so it, you can definitely you can definitely restrict um, uh, network access, and that's something that you can you you can configure. Um, you can also disable sandboxing entirely uh, entirely with, with Bazel. So um, so yeah, I, yeah. I, I think I think you've got a feature set. There. Um, okay, um, you, it's so hard to search Google, Twitter, etc. For please, uh, <laughs> do you have some recommendation? For example, Go uses GoLang. Uh, please build generally has a bit better search results. Um, but yeah, it's quite a small community still. So you, you don't necessarily find that much on like stack overflow. Um, yeah. Um, I, well, the questions are coming in. Um, <laughs> how limited is the dynamic rule generation? Are there any constraints to the rules that I can add in a post build rule? Yeah, so you can't add uh, stuff to already built. So you can't add dependencies to already built targets. Um, so you, you can't have like a restarting scheduler there. Um, so you can only add dependencies to the build graph to things that are dependent on you. So if I am target A and uh, I'm a dependency of target B, in my post build function, I can add some dependencies to target B. That makes sense. So there's, it's quite controlled in that sense. Right. Um, assuming you wanted to move to a different tool, what are Pleaser's killer features that would keep you from doing that? Um, I think it might just be like uh, like the the debugging tooling around like please query print and uh, please build dash dash shell. I think developing build rules without that is I find it really quite tr tricky. Um, and another thing is uh, I think. The extent that the sort of homogenous design allows you to do quite advanced stuff. Like if you just want to glue a bunch of um, build uh, generals together to, uh, you know, it's quite easy to write a build rule and depend on that as a tool and just have that all work um, up front. Um, like glue things together. So uh, I, I think I've tried something similar in Basel. It's a little bit more tricky. All right. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, thank you very much. See you around.